Great. Hey, peeps. Hi. Uh, welcome to the lecture about a midwife's tale. A, a note of caution. If you're watching this or you've opened this and you're listening to it, before you watch the documentary, stop. Stop now. Bad student. Go back. Watch the video, okay? Um, because this isn't going to make any sense until you've seen the documentary. Watch the documentary. Listen to the lecture, all right? If you have seen the documentary, welcome. Let's go forward. Uh, before we change slides, I, this uh, the documentary you watched was based on um, uh, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's A Midwife's Tale, and she won the Pulitzer Prize in American History for that book way back in the way back. And I like a lot of things about that documentary, um, including it shows you how people lived, regular people, and particularly women, um, in the days right before and right after the American Revolution. But I also like that it shows you how an historian works and, and how she thought about things as she was going along, how she figured out things, and hopefully, um, I think, communicated some of her quiet passion for figuring out the lives of these people. Because I, I just think that's really neat, and I hope you did too a little bit. Okay, next slide. All right, um, this PowerPoint is based on a handout. Indeed, if you went to my webpage, you could find the handout. And what we would have done in class, if we would have opened up the handout and put it up on the big screen, and I'd have just talked my way through it, and you'd have taken notes. But so instead, we have this. So the handout has got two sections, themes. The top half of this uh, handout is a list of themes from the midwife's tale that I think are significant. And indeed, they're based on chapters from Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's book. And the second half of the handout is based on um, a, a sort of lies or myths that the American path, that Americans tell about the past, that a midwife's tale can help us understand our nonsense. So first here, we're going to go through the themes one at a time, right? One, two, three. Oh, by the way, this um, PowerPoint is about half as long as all the rest of them because you've already spent a bunch of time watching the documentary, okay? So this this shouldn't take us more than half an hour or so. We'll see. I'll try not to talk too much. All right, next slide. Number one. So here you can officially start taking notes. Theme number one, diaries is historical source material. So the thing is, his, because remember I said the first day, history is based on a study of the written word. So when you study the written word, it turns out you study generally the people who were in power because the people in power know how to write. The people in power uh, uh, then save the stuff they write. Um, and the people in power end up in the government records, military records, etc., etc. So if you went back and you studied the American Revolution using the usual sources, the sources from the Continental Congress, the sources from the Boston or, or, or Jamestown, Virginia newspapers, you get the doings of the great men and the great people, the powerful and rich people. Um, what Laurel Thatcher Ulrich did here was find a diary up in the Maine State Historical Society and use that. And by changing the source, we have an entirely different way to think about the American Revolution. Um, instead of like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and doing all that stuff, we have what were people doing? And you'll notice for Martha Ballard and her family, the American Revolution isn't a particularly big deal. They don't really care what the founding fathers are doing. They, much like you, they have their regular lives and they're worried about making a living, talking to the neighbors, getting dinner made, rolling the hay with Sally Pierce, that kind of thing. So when you change the source, you change the story. And that's extremely important for women's history. Next slide. domestic life as history. This is probably something you've never thought of, but it's it's very much related to the, what I was just talking about in the previous slide. That is domestic life, everyday life, the stuff you're doing, and you're really doing. I mean, in a world uh, now with the, the what pandemic, there you go, I blocked it out. <laughs> Wouldn't we all like to? Anyway, uh, I, your life is all about your domestic life. And, and it turns out that's what's important Anytime. If you were listening to this slide a year from now when the pandemic had passed, 
still your everyday life is important. What is your family doing? What is your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or spouse doing? What are your kids doing? Um, do you need to go to the grocery store and buy coffee? Um, what's for dinner? I need to get, I can't afford tires. Uh, what am I going to do? Uh, all that stuff, that regular stuff. But when you look at history books, it's, it's not that stuff. It's all this other stuff. It's, you know, it's like when you watch the news and people are going on and on about politics or whatever, and you and it's easy to get sucked into, oh, that's super important, but you turn off the TV or the computer and you walk away and it turns out that's not what important in your life. What's important in your life is I need to wash a dog and I need to take a nap and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I like about this documentary is by changing the source, we not only we not only change who is in the story, we change what the story is about. The story is about everyday lives. And because for women, that's mostly where we are. Then until very recently, or I could argue it not at all, women don't really figure greatly into public life, the kind of stuff that shows up um, in the history books. You don't get women in the history, uh, histories of presidencies or much in the histories of wars. Though, as we learned last week, we probably should. But nonetheless, domestic life means the lives of women and children and people who get left out. And that's cool. Right? Next slide. Healthcare in the United States, or healthcare in early America. You now know more about healthcare in the revolutionary period than any other American. And I think there's uh, um, some really interesting things about that. One, stuff that looks really stupid to us was stuff Martha took really seriously, like the business about the onion on the foot. And the reality is, it'd be easy to make fun of that stuff, but in truth, we all do stupid stuff that doesn't matter. Like, for example, I went into the CVS the other day to get <laughs> wine and sleeping pills, and when I was getting sleeping pills, I noticed the cold and, few, cold and flu pew the aisle, my, my mother used to call aisles pews because she's a Catholic school girl. Anyway, that aisle, all the cold and flu medicine was gone. Well, cold and flu medicine isn't going to keep you from getting COVID. It, 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 it's, not. it's not. It's a virus. It doesn't care about over-the-counter drugs. But people bought them, hoarded them, took them home. It isn't going to do a darn thing for you, except that I'd be willing to bet that people took their cold and flu medicine and felt better. And, and the onion on the foot and stuff like that is the same thing. It's the same thing. If you think it's medicine, it's medicine. And in the revolutionary era, their stuff just looked different. They didn't have Dayquil. They had tea, onions, etc., etc. Also, I thought that business about the, the male doctors not being particularly trusted, really interesting. Uh, one, doctors are really kind of just, as the video said, just getting into the business of, of, of women's health care, which is primarily the reproductive side. And you'll note that doctor had no idea what he was doing. Like he gave his doctor, he gave his patient, and if I'd have been in the room with you watching the video, I would have told you. But that stuff he gave her is a tincture of opium, opium, uh, the, the parent plant for heroin. That is, he gave her this really powerful opioid, and yeah, sure, yeah, she, she felt better, and and her her labor pains probably did stop. But here's the problem with that, and I think you can all see it coming. <laughs> the baby's still got to come out, and contractions hurt. They're supposed to, and that's okay. The cool thing about contractions hurting is at the end of it, you have a baby, and it's so cool. So it's way better than you broke your arm and it hurts, and at the end of it, all you've got is a broken arm, right? So... Anyway, so one, the doctor doesn't know what he's doing. Two, he's not particularly well trusted. And indeed, you saw that scene where, with the autopsy uh, where Martha Ballard was watching. It turns out there was a Massachusetts law that said that when male doctors were autopsying women, a female, what, a midwife had to be present. The assumption was the midwife was female. And, and that law was put in place because people thought that male doctors left unsupervised with a female corpse might sexually violate it. Ew! Ah! Feel free to scream in horror right now. Um, and I'm not saying that doctors did, but it all it suggests a mindset about doctors, that they were sort of people, uh, suspicious, 
not all that respectable. So that's a very different way of thinking about male health care providers. One last thing about this. You'll notice all the way through that movie, women gave birth not by laboring in bed, but by being up in a squatting position or using the birthing chair, which is up. And, and that's because that's the way gravity works. Things go down. Women aren't designed to have babies in bed lying in their back. It's not a good position. It's not a strong position. If you don't believe me, go in your room, shut the door. You guys do this too. Shut the door. Uh, lay on your, Take your pants off. Lay on the bed. Stick your legs in the air and, and, and see how strong you feel and then see how good you are at pushing and compare that to how good you are at pushing in the seated position, if you know what I mean, right? I don't mean to be gross. But, um, so, so, so this business that, that in, we have in modern America where women uh, labor from the bed, that's because eventually doctors will get in to the, officially into the business of birthing babies. And one of the things they'll do first is drive midwives out of the business, take over it, and then they'll medicalize childbirth, right? And they'll change the language. So if it goes from women giving birth to doctors delivering babies. Notice in the doctors deliver babies, the mother figures not at all in that language. It's just weird because the babies were made by us and are coming out of us. Um, and then they, they put women on their backs with their legs up in the air because that's the easiest way for the doctor to look in and to fiddle around with the baby. And then the scary thing about that, it's not, not just sk look, fiddling around with babies, they're fiddling around with women's vaginas. Um, is, is this is before germ theory. So these guys didn't wash their hands. They didn't wash their instruments. They stuck this dirty stuff inside of laboring women's bodies. And by 1850, so 50 years after Martha Ballard died, the mortality rate for mothers in America was 50%. That is 50% of women who were pregnant died in labor, which is really, really high. Um, how many mothers did Martha lose? None. None. So doctors get into the business of birthing babies and women die. Yay. Not yay. Anyway, depressing, but interesting. Next slide. Religion permeated everyday life. Theme four. Uh, and, and what I like about this is while religion or spirituality permeated everyday life, it wasn't the church but rather the belief in the divine. We like to think that in the past everybody went to church, and indeed we'll have a myth about that later. But Martha, indeed, partway through her life, quits going to church, and nobody thinks sort of much of it. So lots of people, apparently, don't go to church, much like our day. But that she does, she does her peas come up, she thinks the divine parent of the universe, uh, a, a baby is born successfully, she thinks the great parent of the universe, and you'll notice that she, she uses that phraseology, oh, great parent of the universe. And maybe you didn't notice it in the, in the documentary, but I've seen it like a billion times, and you've seen it once, and that's okay. Um, but I think what's interesting about that language is this is a woman who quits going to church and starts referring, and starts referring to God as the great parent of the universe instead of saying he and referring to God in the masculine. So she's making a conscious effort to avoid the pronoun he, him, masculine pronouns. And let me tell you, as somebody who did that herself, um, I've decided a long time ago I didn't believe in a male God. And if you you do, that's cool. I'm not being judgy, and I'm not telling you what you have to do. Um, and you don't be judgy of me. Okay? Cool. Yay! Um, anyway, so an immense effort, and I'm still working on it 20 years later, to not refer to God and the he. Um, it, you have to make an effort to do that. So here Martha makes an effort. And it's not that she changes her pronouns, but she changes from he, him, God to oh, great parent of the universe. So let's think about that for just a second. What's Martha do for a living? That's right. She's a midwife. Oh, you're so smart. She's a midwife. Um, and, and, and what does a midwife do? That's right. It's the baby delivering thing. So if you're Martha, who's the parent? Oh, <gasps> mother's. So I think what she's doing there, and again, I'm just guessing, but that's what historians do, is make informed guesses. Um, I'm guessing she's she had in that imbroglio over the church and the judge and the rape of the minister's wife, she not only quit going to church, she started thinking about God differently. I think she got suspicious of male authority, 
which makes sense. Remember that last week's lecture. And um, she began thinking about God as something else, something not masculine. And I think that's really interesting because I think we think that only like crazy old hippie feminist professors do that. But here's Martha 200 years ago. Cool, huh? Next slide. In the New Republic. And we're going to talk about this again, too, but hey, sex. Uh, uh, the premarital sex was not frowned upon in Martha's world. There was a sort of a notion that you could have all the sex you wanted as long as, if you got pregnant, the couple married. And that's interesting. That should be interesting to all of you. And we're going to talk about that a bunch more in the later in the thing, so I don't want to burn a lot of it here. But I think we do imagine somehow in the past everybody kept their knees together and their penises in their pants. And, and that's just simply not true at any time in American history. Uh, and certainly in the colonial time, they had a fairly refreshing uh, approach to sex. Yeah. Next slide. Also, um, this is the last theme, theme number six, pre-industrial labor. So we live in a post-industrial revolution world. And, and we live in a world where, at least until like last week, you went to work or you went to school and then you came home. So work, both the waged work, like your job, and your not waged work, school, work happened someplace else, outside of the home, and then you'd come home and home is the place of not work. Now, that's not true at all, and we're going to talk a lot about that, I think, next week's lecture. Because I don't know about you guys, but I come home and I have all this shit to do. Laundry that needs to be folded, dog pee that needs to be mopped, uh, dinner that needs to be made, etc., etc., etc. But anyway, the pre-industrial world is a little bit like our world right now here with the COVID virus. That is, home and work are all mixed up. Everybody's Martha goes to people's homes. To, to, to do their health care. She doesn't have an office in town and they come to her. Uh, uh, Ephraim Ballard works from home and then he goes out in the field to do his work, either his surveying work or his tax collecting work. Um, it's not a world where work and home are separate. So it's, it's and for much, most of American history, for most of human history, that's the way the world was. It's the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s that changes all that. So here we're seeing in Martha's world the last gasp of a world uh, of home-centered work until apparently we just recently returned to it, right? Yeah. Okay, next slide. Right, that ends part one of the Midwife's Tale lecture. So now you're going to go to part two and finish up, okay? It's not very long. It's just my Wi-Fi is weak, so I need this in two parts. All right? Okay, see you there. Bye, peeps.